Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Hanan Harari from the Arab International Academy. Today, we're going to talk about introduction to poetry. We are going to talk about the following. First of all, we're going to start with an introduction to poetry. We're going to introduce poetry in general. Then we're going to talk about what is poetry. We're going to define poetry. We're going to talk about types of poetry discuss the word choice, imagery, figurative language, musical devices, structure, importance of poetry, characteristics of poetry, elements of poetry and forms, and we're gonna end up with a conclusion. Let's start, first of all, with an introduction to poetry. So usually when we talk about poetry, and when we're talking about understanding poetry, we must always bear in mind the essential twofold approach to the reading of poetry. We must understand both the literal sense of the poem, as well as what it symbolizes or the symbolic or suggested meaning of the poem. That means that usually poems are not implied directly, but we have to read between the lines because they symbolize something. Usually the poet reveals an extraordinary sensitivity to the diction of his poetry. So the words that he chooses or she chooses are very sensitive to poetry. He or she selects words that best express both what he or she feels or thinks and what he or she wishes his reader's response to be. So basically he is or she is leading the readers. We should always understand our, at the outset that poetry can be written for different reasons and therefore each poem has a different purpose. That's why we always discuss purposes of poetry. To become appreciative readers of poetry, it is necessary that we go and analyze what we are reading on both literal and symbolic levels, because sometimes we won't understand what the poem means literally, so we have to read between the lines. If we make no effort to understand poetry in various ways, we cannot really consider ourselves good readers. As Ben Jensen advised his readers, he said, Brady, take care, that takes my book in hand. To read it well, that is to understand. So we have to understand in order to be able to read. Readers also like Ralph Waldo Emerson and T.S. Eliot have repeatedly remarked, we arrive at a greater understanding of people and of our society by understanding and by arriving to understand poetry than is indeed a direct link between literature we read and the life we lead. So basically poetry tells everything about our life. Therefore, if we want to understand life, we have to read poetry and we have to read between the lines. So when we analyze poetry, we begin the process by separating the poem into its component parts. So this is the part where we starting start breaking poetry into its components. This accomplished, we try to examine each of the parts first separately, then we relate them to each other, and finally in relationship to the whole. This accomplished, then when we try to examine each of the parts first separately and then in relation to each other, then we, uh, we, we, we relate to the whole. Usually in poetry, the elements forming the whole have a great dependency on each other. Sometimes once we have taken a poem apart, we automatically understand the central image and then we understand quickly all of the other parts. Analysis, in other words, is a process of intellectual dis dissection of a whole into its ingredients in order to understand and appreciate the integrity and message of the whole, which is the poem. Sometimes the best place to begin one's analysis of a poem is with the title.
in a poem for Emily Dink Dickinson, there is no frigate like a book. We should thus ponder the title, read the title carefully and ask what makes the title of the very first line meaningful. So she said, there is no frigate like a book. There is no frigate like a book to take us lands away, nor any coursers like pages, like pages of prancing poetry. This traverse may the poorest take without oppressive thought. How frugal is the chariot that bears the human soul. So we see that the first line is explained in the rest of the poem where she shows the importance of reading books, especially poetry books. So the poem is short and to the point. We have been able to arrive at an understanding of both meaning and composition merely by pondering the title in relationship to the, to the poem. We find Emily Dickinson clever with her diction when she makes use of such words as frigate, sounding as free plus gate. So that would make it frigate. That is, as we open a book, a gate is freely opened into a world of imagination, ideas, experiences, feelings, and other emotions. In other words, if we find a short poem with a challenging title, we can often analyze the poem skillfully by explaining its diction. When one takes note of the term traverse, a combination of traveling and verse, one can easily grasp the gist of the poem. It makes you travel away. So now we come to define poetry. So what is poetry? When we talk about poetry, we have to know that poetry is a form of literary or literary art which uses aesthetic and rhythm, rhythmic qualities of language such as phonoesthetics, sound symbolism, and meter. And these are related to beauty and to, to the rhythm inside the poem. To evoke meanings in addition to, or in place of the proce processed ostensible meaning. Poetry has a long history, dating back to the Sumerian epic of Gil Gilgamesh, Early poems evolved from folk songs such as the Chinese Shiging, or from a need to retell oral epics, as with the Sanskrit Vedas, Zoroastrians, Gathas, and the Homeric epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey. All these were poetry, ancient poetry. Actually, ancient attempts to define poetry such as Aristotle's poetics, focused on the uses of speech and rhetoric, drama, song, and comedy. Later attempts concentrated on features such as repetition, verse form, and rhyme, and emphasized the aesthetics which distinguish poetry from more objectively informative, prosaic forms of writing. From the mid 20th century, poetry has sometimes been more generally regarded as a fundamental creative act in fine language. That's why it is, it includes aesthetics. That's why it includes imagination. That's why it includes creativity because we employ language in a very creative way. Now we're going to discuss the types of poetry. Let's just start first of all with the sonnet. A sonnet is a one stanza poem of four lines, written in iambic pentameter. One way to describe a verse line is to talk about how many stressed and non-stressed syllables are there in the line. A simple grouping of syllables, some stressed, some unstressed, is called a foot. The iambic foot is unstressed syllable, followed by a stressed syllable, Pentameter means that there are five feet in the line. Iambic and pentameter then means a line of 10 syllables 
which alternates unstressed and stressed syllables according to the iambic rhythm. The ode. The ode means a musical poem. This is a poem that has a complex structure, which is not easy, and language of good quality that is meant to be sung. So usually they sing this. So the word ode is a, is a Greek origin, is from a Greek origin and is derived from the word ode. Now, another type of poetry is lyrics. Lyrics are a set of words that make up a song, usually consisting of verses and choruses. The writer of the lyrics is a lyric lyricist. Lyricist. The words of an extended musical composition, such as an opera, or however, usually known as libretto, and the writer as a librettist. The meaning of lyrics can either be implicit, very clear, or implicit, you have to conclude it. Some lyrics are abstract, you cannot really uh, feel them, but you, can, you have to imagine them almost untangible. And in such cases, their expli explication emphasizes from articulation how we pronounce them, from the meter, the length, and the symmetry of expression. The ballad. It is a form of verse, often a narrative set to music. Ballads are derived from the medieval French chanson, balladier or baladi, which were originally dancing songs. Ballads are particular characteristics of popular poetry and some of the British isles from the later medieval period until the 19th century and used extensively across Europe and the Americas, Australia, and North Africa. Many ballads were written and sold as single sheet broad songs. The form was often used by poets and composers from the 18th century onwards to produce lyrical ballads. In the later 19th century, it took on the meaning of a slow form of popular love story, and the term is now often used as synonymous with love song, particularly the pop or rock power ballad. As for epic, this is another kind of poetry. Epic is a lengthy narrative poem ordinarily concerning a serious subject containing details of heroic deeds and events significant to a culture or nation. Oral poetry may qualify as an epic and Albert Lord and Milman Perry have argued that classical epics were fundamentally an oral poetic form. Another type of epic poetry is epilion, plural epilia, which is a brief narrative poem with a romantic or mythological theme. Uh, mythological, that means coming from the word myth, which is not true, and not a uh, story that is not true. The term, which means little epic, came into use in the 19th century. It refers to the or the dude, shorter hexameter poems of the Hellenistic period and the similar works composed in Rome from the age of Neotrix. To a lesser degree, the term includes some poems of the English Renaissance, particularly those influenced by Ovid. Lulavi is a soothing piece of music, which usually, which is usually played or sung to young children before they go to sleep, with the intention of aiding that purposes. As a result, the music is often, often simple and repetitive. Lulavis can be found in many countries and have existed since ancient times. Dirge, a dirge is some some song or Lament expressing mourning or grief when somebody dies or there's a disaster, such as 
would be appropriate for performance at a funeral. The English word dirge is derived from the Latin dirge. Algae. In literature, an algae is a mournful, melancholic, or plaintive poem, especially a funeral song or a lament for, for the dead. There is also the nonsense, which is a communication via speech, writing, or any symbolic system, which usually lacks coherence and meaning. So sometimes in an ordinary usage, nonsense is synonymous with absurdity or the ridiculous, which is silly. Many poets, novelists, and songwriters have used nonsense in their works, often creating entire works, using it for reasons ranging from pure comic, to use it for comedy, to use it for um, amusement, or to illustrate a point about language of reasoning. In philosophy of language and philosophy of science, nonsense is distinguished from sense or meaningfulness, and attempts have been made to come up with a coherent and cons consistent method of distinguishing sense from nonsense. It is also an important field of study in cry, a cryptography, cry, uh, sorry, cryptography regarding as or separating a signal from nonsense. Pastoral, pastoral's lifestyle is that of shepherds, herding livestock around open areas of land according to seasons and the cha changing availability of water and pasturage. It lends its name to a genre of literature, art, and music that depicts such life in an idealistic matter. Typically for urban audiences, a pastoral is a work of this genre. A pastoral is a work of art that deals with rurality or a work of art that had a ruler setting. A, ruler's, a rural setting, that means in the city and not in a faraway village. Another kind also of poetry is the panegyric. A panegyric is a form public, formal public speech or written verse delivered in high praise of a person or thing. A generally high studied and discriminating theology, not expected to be critical. In Athens, such speeches were delivered at national festivals or games. With the object of arousing, with the object of, arouse, of rousing the citizens to emulate the glorious deeds of their ancestors. Now we come to talk about word choice. So as we have talked about the types of poetry, it's very important to know how poets usually, or uh, poets usually use words for their poems. What difference does it really make whether a poet uses one or another of synonyms such as bond, tie, link, or connection, for example? The answer is that it can matter a great deal. In addition to their denotations or dictionary meanings, words have different histories. So it's about the history that it holds in the word itself. Choosing a word with the wrong connotation for your purposes is the same thing as singing a song out of tune. So that would be something that is very strange. For example, would you describe a friendship as a link or a connection? The word bond in this case is better able to convey the warm feelings that friends have for each other. So the word that is suitable in this case is the word bond. Mood and tone also depend on a poet's choice of words. So mood is the feeling that the poem creates while tone is the attitude that a poet takes toward his or her subject and readers. So if a poet, for example, calls a French a connection, he or she may be creating a tone of disapproval toward it. So the word shows that he doesn't really like that kind of friendship because he said it's a connection. So he gave somehow a negative connotation for the word. So the choice of words may also call up a mood of coldness and a lack of caring. It shows that the old poet 
is not really caring and he is very cold toward that kind of relationship. Other factors besides word choice, however, can also influence mood and tone of poem. Let's talk, for example, about the imagery. It's coming from the word image. So that means a poet's use of words to create mental pictures or images that communicate experience. It's very important for the poet, when a reader is reading his poem, to give him the feeling of imagining things, having some mental pictures to imagine things. An image may appeal to any one of the five senses, though in literature, visual images are the most common. Then Theodore describes a meadow mouse as a wriggling like a minuscule puppy. So in this case, he is using visual imagery to give us a mental picture of the mouse, which makes sense in this case. When Margaret also Walker in memory speaks of windswept streets of cities on cold and blustery nights. She's using images and imagery that appeals to our sense of touch or physical sensation. And we start imagining that kind of night and that city and the streets in the, this city. So imagery is one of the most important resources poets make use of to capture and express experience. Figurative language. So figurative language is a language that is not intended to be interpreted literally. So you cannot really read the sentence and explain it as is. Three common types of figurative language are metaphor, simile, and personification. A simile is a figurative comparison that does not use the word like that does not use the word like, sorry, that uses the word like or as. So we do, do say, she looks as beautiful as the flower. So she is like a flower, we use the word as. When we say, for example, a metaphor, when we say it is a, another kind of figurative comparison, but it does not really use the word like in the or as. So we might be saying, she is a flower or she she walks um, she walks uh, uh, um, with power for example personification is giving the meaning or the giving uh, giving a human characteristic to non human a human to non human things for example uh, she is a horse she is a horse that means she's very tough like a horse or she's very fast like a horse. Now we're going to talk about musical devices. This is another thing that affects the mood and the tone in the poem. The term musical devices refers to the various ways poets use the sound of words to enrich their poetry. One of the most frequently used devices is alliteration. The repetition of the same consonant sounds, usually at the start of words. Hindulamer, for example, writes of the forest's ferny floor, af, af, af. Each word starts with the same sound. He's using this device. A similar device is assonance, the repetition of vowel sounds, like po, and he uses this device in line three of the bells. What a world of merriment their melody foretells. The letter O, the vowel sound O, is repeated in many times in the same line. In the same poem, he uses another musical device, onomatopoeia. This is the use of the word whose sound imitates or suggests sound. How they tinkle, tinkle, he says of the bones. Alliteration assonance and often onomatopoeia are forms of the most basic musical device of all, which is repetition. This device is found not only in particular words or sounds, but also in the structure of entire lines of verse. In one of the passages, all the lines after the first are structured the same way, 
each has pairs of contrasting phrases, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. Such repetition of similar structure is called parallelism. The device is fundamental to the kind of verse white men wrote free verbs, verse. Now we come to talk about the structure. The structure of a poem may be described in terms of number one, it's a stanza form and it's meter, which we talked about when we started talking about uh, uh, sonnets. A stanza is a unit with a set number of lines. One of the most common stanza forms is the couplet. A couple of, a couple is a stanza made of two rhymed lines as follows. True ease in writing comes from art, not chance, as those move easiest to have learned to dance. Another very common stanza form is quatre, a stanza of four lines with any one of several rhyme patterns. Meter in this way is the pattern of accented and, uh, and not unaccented syllables, which have accent, that form the basis of the poem's rhyme. There are a great many different meters in poetry with many different names. What each one signifies is the number of rhythmic beats, which is called feet, in a line and the arrangement of accented, accented and unaccented syllables in each foot. For example, each line in the couple quoted above has five feet, that is five beats. The five beat line is called a yandic pentameter. Now we're going to talk about the importance of poetry. First of all, language awareness. Poetry actually increases a student's literacy and linguistic awareness. According to Dr. Janet in the research report for the literacy and democracy of Ontario in Ontario, they studied poetry. Well, they believe that po studying poetry can help students to expand their oral and written vocabulary skills. Reading and writing poetry also helps the students to become more aware of the ways in which language can be used and the rhythms, images, and meanings that can be created. Another importance is the critical awareness. According to a 2002 study by California poets in schools, students who study poetry in the classroom increase their skills of what we call critical analysis. So they become better thinkers. They are critical analysis, analytics. So poems use a variety of techniques such as metaphor, imagery, rhymes, and meter to convey the meaning. Picking out these techniques and thinking about how they function in the poem helps students to develop their analytic and critical skills. So poems can also have multiple layers of meaning that readers must analyze carefully to understand. Another importance is creativity and enthusiasm. Students can become very enthusiastic, very excited about poetry in the classroom. Connecting their reading experiences to their experiences of music and their own lives, allowing students to write poetry for a class actually encouraged them to express themselves creatively through some students, though some students may not be motivated by writing academic papers, poetry allows them to play freely with words, rhythms, and ideas. For example, Carol's poem, The Jab Jab Jabberwocky, uses made up words like Nimsi and Borogovs to play creatively with rhythm, sound, and language. Another important thing about poetry is the community. So poetry in the classroom helps students to connect to others. Poetry encourages students to view the complexities of the world in new ways and to develop empathy and understanding for other points of view. For instance, Elizabeth Bishops in the waiting room describes a girl's experience of the deep connections that exist between people and her discovery of what 
held us all together or made us all just one. Discussing poetry in the classroom can help us to promote connections between students, encouraging them to think about the different ways that their classmates interpret the poems. Thank you for listening to me.